let's get the ball rolling. Nick, could you give us a little bit about your background in publishing and uh, how you came to become an expert in Facebook ads? Sure. I've been publishing for, I guess, about 12 years now. Started back in 2012. And obviously a big part of just uh, publishing is getting eyes on your book and trying to generate sales. And that's how I started with finding out more about marketing. And then that leads you to things like the Facebook ads and the Amazon ads and ultimately ended up running a lot of Facebook ads and Amazon ads for a variety of clients in a lot of different genres from romance to thriller to fantasy and science fiction. So I've run ads in almost any genre. And then, you know, you uh, keep learning and keep trying to test new things because the ads change over time and just try to keep up with that. So uh, if you're just starting out, like there is a significant learning curve. It is something that you can learn, however. And if you're in the position where you're trying to keep the ads going and keep up with all the changes, then uh, hopefully we can uh, go over some of the things that have changed over time uh, today as well. Where were you in your author journey when you started running Facebook ads? Did you only have a single book published or did you have five books published? Honestly, it was pretty late. I think it was 2016 or 2017. And what I would recommend is if you're just getting started, I would start sooner rather than later because you can cut down on that time that it takes to learn. If you keep waiting for five years, then you have to start from square one five years later. So it was something that I thought about for quite some time, but I just never actually did it until four or five years in. And I'm not sure how many books I had at that point. Probably six under that pen name, if I had to guess, but I, I can't exactly remember, but probably six, I think. Do you think that you need to have a certain number of books published before you start running Facebook ads? Or can you start when you only have a single book published? I think it depends on your goal. If your goal is to be profitable, you probably need three books in the series to really have a realistic shot of doing that. There are certainly exceptions where you might be able to make a standalone or a two book series profitable, but that's pretty difficult, especially if you're just starting out and don't have a ton of skill with the ads yet. But if your goal is to learn and to figure out the ropes of the platform, what are the best practices here with the settings? How do I make compelling images and create ad copy that gets people to buy the book? How do I get some feedback on how things like my blurb and my cover are performing? Ads are a great way to do that because if you're sending a lot of people to the book page and you're not getting any sales, you're not getting any page reads from it, then you may have a problem with the blurb and cover. I think it's worthwhile to start earlier rather than later. You just want to start with an amount that you're comfortable with investing and not seeing that return for a while. So it's not going to be the case where the initial money that you put into the ads is likely to generate a significant return. In fact, it's much more likely that you lose that money, but you learn things about the ads and you build that skill and position yourself for when you have more books in your catalog that you can potentially make them profitable at that point. So I would recommend starting earlier rather than putting it off, but only invest money that you're comfortable with losing. And you can start with a small amount, $5 a day. It doesn't have to be the case where you invest $50 a day right from the start or thousands of dollars. Even if you have a gigantic budget potentially to invest in your book, I wouldn't recommend starting with that right out of the gate. You have to test things. You have to build that skill set, and that takes time. So the money will be there to invest later once you have those skills, but you don't need to spend all that right from the start if you do have a war chest going in to invest in your books. It sounds like starting with as little as $5 a day and using that just to learn before you scale up those ads, uh, try and get them to that point where you can make them profitable on that $5 a day. And then that's when you can start spending more money. Is that the way to think about it? 
it's going to be much easier to spend $5 a day and keep your cost per click, which you'll see abbreviated as CPC. It's easier to keep that lower, the less that you're spending. And then it's also easier to get your ads to convert better, which means generate sales and page reads when you're spending less money. The more that you increase your ad budget, the more your cost per click tends to go up and the more your conversion rate tends to decline. So by starting at a low amount and getting the lay of the land, testing things at a low budget, then you can figure out if you have any problems with your, say, cover or blurb or just with the ad settings, things like that, address them without spending a massive amount of money and then increase the ad spend as you're seeing more sales and reads come in. So I think that starting with $5, if you're just starting out with the ads, that's a great approach. You can start with somewhere between five to 10. The benefit of investing a little bit more money is that it's easier to see the increases in sales and page reads. If you spend $5 a day, then a lot of times you're only going to potentially get an additional one sale or one borrow. So whatever number of page reads is equivalent to a full read through of your book. So it might be 200 pages or 300 pages or something like that. That can be hard to discern from just regular day-to-day -day variants if you're already selling some books. And so if you start at say 10 or 12 or 15 or something like that, still a relatively low amount, but just a little bit more ad spend, then it can make it easier when you're going into your KDP dashboard to see the impact of the ads or lack thereof, because you probably should see an impact if you're spending $12, $15 a day. If your book isn't ranked, say like, I would say 10,000 or lower in the store, if you have a book that's ranked in the top 100, you're not going to be able to see the impact of $15 a day. And by top 100, I mean top 100 in the overall Kindle store, not in a specific category. But if your book is ranked 10,000 or above, so like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 100,000, et cetera, then somewhere between five to $15 a day should be sufficient to see that impact of the Facebook ads. What are the key elements of a successful Facebook ad? So with the Facebook ad itself, which I refer to as the ad creative, the easiest thing to start with is just going to be the book cover on the book cover background because you already have those elements. If you don't have the book cover background, then you can often get that from your designer for less than $50. And it's a very versatile marketing asset. You can use it for a lot of different things. So I'd highly recommend doing that. And then you can also run the book cover background by itself without the book cover on it. And that really helps with congruence when people click on the ad because they click on the ad, it has your book cover on it or it has your book cover background on it. And then they go over to Amazon and they see that they're in the right place. We've all had that experience clicking on ads where it's like 10 celebrity hacks that are amazing and number six is going to blow you away and then you click on it and it doesn't actually deliver the promise. And that's a really common thing online. So People are jaded because of that, and they're not going to give you much leeway if they click on something and it doesn't really quickly align with their expectations. There are certainly other images that you can run, but that's a very easy and straightforward way to ensure congruence between the ad and the Amazon page where someone clicks on the ad and they're like, oh, this is actually what I clicked on and this is what I expected it to be. And... Then with the primary text, which I refer to as copy. So this is going to be at the top of the ad. And I can actually share some examples if we want to see some. Yeah, that would be movies. awesome. We'd so love to see some straight. examples of successful Facebook ads. So this is the, and can people see my screen here? Yeah. No. Yeah. If you could, if you could zoom in a bit more cool. still. So here, these both have the book cover on the book cover background. And then at the top here, I have what's called a teaser. So that's a one to two sentence, just piece of ad copy. 
that highlights the conflict in the book or some key elements. So these are things that people like about this book, Talking Dog, and then these are the main characters in the book. This is a deal. So I'm mentioning that it's a deal, but what I actually generally start with a lot of the time as the ad copy up here, um, and again, Facebook refers to this as the primary text if you're looking at the Facebook ads dashboard, I'll just start with the book blurb or a part of the book blurb. The reason for that is one, you've already written it. So it's easy to go and put that as your ad copy. And then the other reason is the same idea, congruence. When people click on the ad, they clicked on it because they saw this specific image, which is your cover on the cover background or the cover background. They clicked on it because they were interested in the blurb. And then they see that on the Amazon page and they say, okay, I'm in the right place. And this aligns with what I was expecting. And so it's really easy to put together. And it also helps you confirm if there are any issues with either of these, because if the performance is bad with your book cover on the ad and your blurb in the ad, and you're sending them to Amazon and you're not getting any sales or page reads, there's probably an issue with your blurb or cover that you want to address before running a bunch more ads and spending a bunch more money, increasing the ad budget or anything like that. So these type of ads are what I would recommend starting with, where the three images that I would recommend starting with, book cover on book cover background, book cover background by itself. And then if you have it, the audiobook cover without the narrator on it. And then the piece of copy that I would run is the blurb. And then as the headline, which is this part of the ad down here, I would run something like new genre book, or if it's new, if it's not new, then just genre book. So you could have thrilling romantic suspense book, thrilling romantic suspense novel, or if your book is in Kindle Unlimited, then you could have urban fantasy series free in Kindle Unlimited, urban fantasy novel free in Kindle Unlimited. And one other thing that's really important about the Facebook ads is that you can advertise other products on Facebook. So it's very easy for people to mistake your ad for a different product entirely. So when I'm assembling the creative elements here, I'm really trying to hammer home the fact that this is a book, which is why having the book cover on the ad tends to be effective because only people who are interested in reading tend to click on those ads. Whereas if you just have a random image that you pulled from say deposit photos or another stock photo site, that could potentially work, but it could also lead the person to believe that this is for a dating app or an exercise machine or something else entirely, depending on what the image itself is of. So by having the book cover on there, that really mitigates a lot of the problems where people are confused about what you're selling and you get a bunch of clicks from people who aren't interested in reading a book. And then by having these elements with the blurb, with the book cover background or the book cover on the book cover background, you ensure that when someone clicks on it, heads over to Amazon, they are going to be confident that they're in the right place. Making it clear that your ad is for a book is also helpful because then when readers click on that ad, that also informs Facebook algorithm that I can target other people that click on ads like this too, right? Yeah, what Facebook is doing is that when you select the traffic objective, which is what you would select if you're sending people to Amazon, is Facebook is going to optimize for the lowest price clicks. And it's going to look at the people clicking on your ad and say, okay, these people, a lot of these people are clicking on the ad. We can go find more similar people to that. So what can happen is if you have a an ad creative that isn't clear about the fact that you're selling a book, Facebook can go find a lot of cheap clicks that aren't people who are actually interested in reading the book. So yeah, hundred percent, you have to think about the Facebook algorithm, but I tend to think of things just from a human perspective where as I'm scrolling through the Facebook newsfeed, 
would it be obvious that this is a book if you just saw a cat meme or someone posting about a family vacation or all the other things that people post on Facebook, would it be very clear at a half second glance? Cause that's really all that you have to catch someone's attention and convey, Hey, this is a book and it may be a book in a genre that you're interested in. That makes sense. One thing I want to clear up before we continue talking about it is are we only talking about Facebook ads or are we also talking about Instagram ads? Because the Facebook ads platform can also share these ads to Meta's other properties, right? Like Instagram. And with the Instagram ads, you can target the, you can serve those from the Facebook ads dashboard. So there you manage them from the Facebook ads dashboard and you can use the same ad creatives that you're using on like with the regular Facebook ads. What I would recommend if you want to target Instagram is you want to split that out into its own campaign because Instagram will typically be about five to 10 cents more expensive. And generally speaking, you don't need to target Instagram specifically unless your audience really is more on Instagram than Facebook. Usually Facebook will outperform Instagram anyway, but if you do want to target Instagram, then I would target it in its own campaign. And you select whether or not to target Instagram under placements at the ad set level. So with the Facebook ads, you just select the Facebook feeds. So there are two of those. So you just select those under placements. Those tend to convert the best. If you do want to target Instagram, then you would make a different campaign. And under those placements, you would just select Instagram feed. One other thing with Instagram that you want to make sure of, if you're using a static image, these are static images that I have up on screen, you want to make sure that it is a square and not this sort of horizontal format because that is Instagram's native format. And in general, squares are going to outperform this type of horizontal format. So I would recommend this regardless of whether you're targeting Instagram specifically or not. But certainly if you are targeting Instagram, you would want to ensure that the ads you're serving there are square images. One of the things that you mentioned earlier was you can use Facebook ads to determine whether or not your book cover and blurb are working based on whether or not that ad is performing well. How do you know whether or not your ad is effective? What is a good guidepost for the conversion rate or the cost on an ad to determine whether or not that book cover and blurb is really hooking readers? That's a good question. And what you're going to find is that any image that has the book cover on it is generally going to be more expensive from a cost per click perspective. The reason for that is because you have a more limited audience there of people who are interested in purchasing books, whereas people may click on the ad if they're unsure of what product you're selling, and that can lower the cost per click for those images without the book cover on it. But in turn, you're not actually getting people to convert, which means they're not purchasing the book. They're not borrowing it in Kindle Unlimited. And that's really what you want. So with the cost per click and the conversion, what constitutes a good CPC or a good conversion rate is going to depend on how long your series is and how strong your sell-through and read-through are. So when someone purchases book one, how many people go on to book two, book three, book four, and how much do you end up making when you factor in those sales? of the rest of the series or the Kindle Unlimited read through in the rest of the series. But let's say you have a single book CPC wise, you probably need your CPC to be at most 12 cents, I would say, but you probably need it to be at 10 or under for the ads to potentially work. And to be clear, that's very difficult to do. That's why advertising standalones or a very short series is challenging. If you have a trilogy, then you probably want that under 15 cents, but probably under 12. And if you have a five book series, then you probably want that 
under 20 cents, but maybe under 18 or even lower. And again, this is going to differ depending on how strong your sell through and read through are to the rest of the series. And so you need to be aware of those numbers. Conversion wise, for a full price book, meaning price $2.99 or higher, I want that conversion for this cover on cover background ad to be at around 2%. And by conversion, I mean the sales plus the borrows that I'm getting in Kindle Unlimited. And you can track those via the Amazon attribution links. You have to convert the page reads into borrows yourself. Amazon doesn't give you that statistic. So you take the number of Kindle Unlimited pages in the book and the number of page reads that the ad has generated. It's going to be page reads divided by the number of Kindle Unlimited pages in the book that gives you borrows. Amazon's term for the number of Kindle Unlimited pages in the book is KEMPC, and that's located on the KDP dashboard. I understand that I'm throwing out a lot of acronyms and things like that. So it can be overwhelming when you're just starting out. But what that 2% conversion rate means is that two out of every 100 people who click on the ad either buy or borrow the book. So that's really the minimum that I'm looking for when I first start this book cover on book cover background ad to a full price book. And again, full price is $2.99 plus in the US. If you're advertising in the UK, then it will be one pound 99. And then if you're advertising a 99 cent book, then I would want that conversion rate for this type of ad to be a minimum of 5%, but probably six, seven, eight would be preferable, but I would say a minimum of five. Otherwise I would be looking at, is there an issue with the cover? Is there an issue with the blurb? And to be clear, for those people who have advertised a book a lot, meaning you've spent thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on that book, that benchmark with the 2% total conversion rate for this particular image with the book cover on the book cover background, that's not necessarily going to apply because as mentioned earlier, your ads fatigue as you spend more money. So your CPC increases over time, your conversion rate drops. So it may be the case that you're coming in under that, especially if you've used the book cover quite a bit on your various ad images. But those are what I would aim for in terms of the CPCs and the total conversion rate there as a general starting point. There are more complicated ways of dialing that in with more accuracy based on what your sell through and read through value are, but those give you some general numbers to shoot for. And what you can see as well is that when you have a longer series, you have a lot more latitude with the CPC as well as the conversion rate, but just focusing on the CPC, you can spend potentially 20 cents a click, or if your series is longer than five books, maybe you can spend 25 cents a click or 30 cents a click and still have the ads be profitable. And so something to keep in mind, the ads in general are going to favor longer series. That doesn't mean that you need a 20 book series or something absurdly long, but once you start hitting that five, six, seven books in the series mark, then the ads generally become much more scalable. And that means that you can increase the budgets significantly. The biggest challenge that people have with increasing their ad spend is that maybe they can spend five or $10 a day and break even or have it be modestly profitable. But once they start inching the budget up to 15, 20, $25 and the CPCs start increasing and those conversion rates start decreasing a little bit, then they're quickly underwater because they're simply not making enough when they sell a copy of the book to offset the advertising costs. At 20 cents, you would know this series needs to be like a five book series for me to ultimately become profitable on these ads. So that's one way to look at it, even if you only have a single book currently out. The other way that you could, the other thing to think about here is 
if you are running ads and your CPC is in the range of 45, 50, 60 cents, that's when you would know, okay, maybe I need to go back to the drawing board on my blurb, or maybe something is off on the cover here. Is that a good sort of guideline for authors in terms of when they would need to be looking at their their blurb or cover and in, in changing those up? Yeah, assuming that like you're using the correct settings on Facebook because you could accidentally select some things that would spike the CPC massively, but assuming that you're using best practices there, if the first time you ran an ad to a book and your CPC was 35, 40, 45 cents with the cover on cover background here, you almost certainly have a problem and your cover probably isn't working all that well. There are exceptions to that, but certainly that would be a cause for alarm. And even if it is working well on Amazon, meaning that when people navigate to the book via non-Facebook ad methods, it converts and sells books, you're still going to encounter the problem where it's not performing well on Facebook. So if you wanted to use that particular cover on Facebook, then you probably have to change something with the cover because it's just too expensive to run. And to be clear about those rules of thumb, that's all they are. There are more precise ways to um, dial that in. And what I'll do is, uh, if it sounds good to you, Evan, I'll have you link to a free crash course that I have on Facebook ads. And it goes through how to calibrate that much more accurately if you want to dive in. But I think just having some very basic benchmarks at the start especially when things are so overwhelming of, am I even in the right vicinity with the CPC and the conversion rate? That's helpful to have, but certainly it can be the case that you could have a higher CPC than what I mentioned or a lower conversion rate and the ads could still work. It's just unlikely that they will. Yeah, I can I can certainly add the link for that in the description. I'm sure everyone is scrambling to write down all of these different acronyms and dollar amounts and all that stuff. So if you have not been able to keep up with all that stuff, we'll we'll put the link to that guide uh, below. One of the other things that you mentioned is you can only really use these CPCs as guidelines for determining whether or not you have a good blurb and book cover if you have all the other stuff in your Facebook ads set up correctly and you're following best practices with those other things as well. I know one major thing there would be targeting, right? So if you are targeting the completely wrong audience, the cost per click for your ads could be extremely high. And it's not because you have a bad book cover or a bad blurb, it's because you're targeting the wrong audience. So. Could you walk us through the best pack practices on doing targeting for Facebook ads? Absolutely. And that will also be in the, the crash course. So if people want to see how to set up an ad step-by-step -step with the current best practices, they can follow along with that as well. For the targeting, I keep things simple and people will debate me on this and argue that authors aren't effective targets. Usually I find that that's not the case and that's why I would recommend starting with authors. There may be other things that perform better, but it's almost never the case where the authors perform really poorly and then something else performs well. So it's a good benchmark in that if this is performing poorly and it's not selling any books whatsoever for me or generating any page reads, then I likely have a problem that's not an audience problem. Maybe I set something up wrong with the settings. Maybe my cover or blurb aren't working. Maybe something with the ad creative themselves isn't working if I'm using something else other than the book cover on the book cover background, that type of thing that we already talked about. But what it does is it allows you to rule that out as a variable when you're testing where you should expect that this will work to some degree. It may not be the absolute best thing. Oftentimes the authors do outperform other targeting options, but it's not going to be the absolute worst thing. I don't think I've ever seen a situation where just the authors targeting authors has performed massively worse than everything else that was tested. So for example, with 
the author targeting, if you're a romance author, you can start with what I call the big six. And this works for contemporary romance. It works for paranormal romance as well. If you're writing something like sci-fi romance, it would work too. And that is E.L. James, Sylvia Day, Diana Gabaldon, Nora Roberts, Daniel Steele, and contemporary romance, the genre. So not romance novels. That's a gigantic tryst on Facebook that doesn't tend to convert very well. Contemporary romance genre. And I've seen millions of dollars in ad spend go to that audience. It's always been a consistent performer in terms of the conversion, solid CPCs. If you're in another genre, just pick authors who are relevant. So for example, we just saw some creatives for my urban fantasy books, Jim Butcher, Patricia Briggs, Laurel K. Hamilton, Alona Andrews. You don't have to overthink things there. The authors don't have to be a one-to-one -one match to what you write in terms of the tone or the style. Just in the same general genre, you may say, hey, I don't really write like E.L. James. My books aren't like that. I don't write billionaire romances, things like that. But I've seen that work for sports romances, for billionaire romances, for mafia romances, et cetera. So it doesn't have to be tight one-to-one -one targeting, just the general vicinity there. And that's sufficient. So for thrillers, you can start with Lee Child, James Patterson, David Baldacci, things like that, Michael Conley, and that will get you in front of relevant readers who are interested in thriller and mystery novels. One thing that I would recommend is turning off Advantage Plus audience, and that allows Facebook to go outside the demographic confines that you select. This is particularly important in romance where typically you're only targeting women because that's 99% plus of the market. So by turning that off and instead using what Facebook rather confusingly calls advantage detailed targeting, almost identically named, not the same thing, but by using that instead, then Facebook will stay within those demographic guidelines. So with advantage detail targeting, if you select women only who are over the age of 21, then Facebook won't start serving your ads to 60 year old men. So I'd recommend again, turning off advantage plus audience that is going to be the default. That's one of those changes that we mentioned at the start of the class where that's probably the biggest change that Facebook has rolled out over the past year. They're really using a lot of AI tech to target people and take more control over that. And so you can turn that off and have a little bit more control on your end over who the ads serve to demographic wise. When you say you're targeting these authors, the way that that is targeted on Facebook is there are a bunch of people on Facebook and some have liked these pages for these various authors, like these top romance authors or top thriller authors or uh, top, you know, fantasy authors. And so the people that have liked those pages, that is what you're telling Facebook that you want to show your ads to the audiences who have liked those pages, liked the Facebook profile page. And then like you were saying, Facebook can go outside of that target demographic, depending on uh, what your how you have your settings set on the ad as well, uh, so that they can try and find other audience, uh, other parts of the audience that might be interested in that ad, but haven't necessarily liked J.K. Rowling's Facebook page or something of that sort. And now, no matter what uh, of those two options you choose, whether it's Advantage Plus Audience or Advantage Detail Targeting, Facebook will go outside your specific interests that you've targeted. So let's say, for example, you targeted E.L. James, like it can go outside of people who have liked E.L. James' Facebook page, who it determines liked E.L. James in other ways, like Facebook gathers a lot of data from a lot of different sources, but it can venture outside that. So what it's targeting actually when you select E.L. James is people who like E.L. James, but also people who Facebook thinks are similar to the people who like E.L. James. What 
using advantage detailed targeting does is it ensures that Facebook doesn't go outside the demographic options that you select. So just if you select women only, it will only serve the ads to women, whereas advantage plus audience can serve the ads to any demographic, regardless of what settings you select. And trust me, I know this is confusing. Um, in the crash course, this is all broken down. Like again, it's free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to opt in for anything. But if you're interested in learning more about that, you can check it out there. But it is very confusing in terms of the names that Facebook has given those two audience targeting options. We've mostly been talking at this point about fiction genres like romance and fantasy and thriller, etc. Does all this stuff that we've been talking about also apply to nonfiction authors? I would say I'm, I'm thinking this through because I haven't really advertised much nonfiction at all. So I don't want to make a sweeping statement and say it's definitely going to be the case that this will work, but I think that it's a good starting point. And then you can find your own best practices and things like that. I think with the nonfiction, you have a lot more latitude with what you can target and realistically get to generate sales for you. And also just with your ad creative, you can have a lot more ideas and formulas to draw from. So if you're advertising nonfiction, what I would really look at is if you're trying to say make better ad creatives, you can start with this idea here where you have the book blurb and your book cover and things like that. But I would study direct response marketing. So like copywriting, because that's going to translate really on a one-to-one -one basis. When you're a fiction author, those principles do apply, but the way that you write an ad for a fiction book is not like, here's the list of benefits, you know, and here's why this is an interesting offer for you. And it's going to make you whatever, um, like uh, save you 20 hours a week or whatever the, the claim is. Like you don't have those same sorts of things to hit on in the fiction ads. You're more trying to build curiosity and intrigue and convey the conflict and suspense and tension and all those elements of storytelling. So it's a little bit different from a copywriting perspective. But I would say that the same general pr principles as a starting point, that would be a good place to begin with the nonfiction stuff. And when it comes to running Facebook ads, I mentioned a little bit earlier, you might also run ads to build your mailing list. You might be pointing readers to a reader magnet that they can get for free when they sign up to join your mailing list, et cetera. Or you might be pointing them to the Amazon store, mostly as we've been talking about. Or you might point them to your direct sales store or web store uh, where you're selling direct, you know, using something like Story Origin. Do you ever run ads to build your mailing list? Do you recommend that as a, an effective way of building your mailing list? Or are you almost exclusively running ads to the Amazon pages for your books or what other ways are you directing traffic? Yeah, that's a highly relevant question right now because I'm actually putting together a, a case study on just that uh, topic. So the short answer is just run the ads to your Amazon page. If you're trying to sell the book on Amazon, if you're trying to sell the book direct, then send them to your Shopify store or whatever. Don't try to build a mailing list via the Facebook ads. It's not a good option in comparison to either of those two from a profitability standpoint. Back when I started with Facebook ads, I think this was around 2017, 2018, when I was really diving into testing for the first time, I, I got somewhere around 10,000 subscribers or so from Facebook. I'm not sure the exact number. Spent around somewhere in the vicinity of five figures accumulating all those subscribers, got some fans from that, but ultimately the payoff was not good when looked at from a profitability perspective, had to remove most of those subscribers because they were not engaged and just not active, not buying books and tested a lot of things with the autoresponder, meaning the series of emails that they get when they sign up. So tested different subject lines, different 
autoresponder flows there and just the numbers didn't work. And part of that could be a skill issue since that was earlier in my career, very early in my as journey. But I think it highlights the difficulty that is sometimes glossed over where one of the most difficult things in marketing online is getting someone's email address who doesn't know you and then convincing them to trust and like you enough to purchase a product. It can be done, but if you look at people who are doing that, it's generally very, very high level marketers and companies that can pull that off and they're testing a lot of things. I don't know if it would ultimately work with the books if you had that skill set, but it's a skill set that I think most people aren't interested in acquiring and they're certainly not interested in the level of testing required. So what you'll see is that if you're running ads for $5 a day, you might be getting subscribers relatively inexpensively for 20 cents or 30 cents or something like that. But when you actually look at the number of books that people are buying, it's not paying off. And then if you have a bunch of unengaged subscribers who are dragging down your open rates, dragging down your deliverability, just the overall engagement metrics, then that can hurt you in terms of getting your emails delivered to your actual fans who signed up from the front and back matter of your books. So it's not something that I would recommend. The other thing is that I found that subscribers from other sources like story origin or book funnel giveaways, things like that, they were of similar engagement and similar quality, but because they were so much cheaper, the numbers could work. So if you're spending say five cents for one of those subscribers, then the numbers profitability wise can actually work out. Whereas if you're spending 30 cents or 40 cents or 50 cents, like you are with the Facebook ads a lot of the time, then that is potentially six to 10 times as much. And it just doesn't really pan out. So anyway, long story short, tried that again this year. So hopefully I'm better at the ads than I was back in 2017 and hopefully better at the marketing as aspects across the board. And just not seeing the sales and page reads from those subscribers at all. Split tested it against the author's organic subscribers, meaning the people from the front and back matter, and just very few sales and page reads. So I wouldn't recommend generating subscribers via Facebook ads. It can be exciting to see your subscriber numbers go up and the sticker price on the Facebook ads dashboard may look appealing, meaning I'm getting subscribers for 20 cents or whatever. This must be paying off. But if they're not buying books, then the numbers don't work. And it might actually be costing you $50 for a sale or $100 for a sale because those subscribers are so unengaged. The one situation where I might do it is if you're just starting to build a mailing list, it can be really slow to get started. And it's not the worst thing in the world to just get some people on there and then you feel like you're not sending your emails out into a vacuum. So like just getting some subscribers on the list and then sending out some emails. But again, you can achieve that by joining some story origin promotions or joining some giveaways and you'll get more subscribers and it's going to cost you less and also be easier to set up as well. Yeah. Cross promotions are are great, especially when you're starting out because they are free, easy, and targeted, right? You're not, <laughs> when you're setting up a cross promotion with another author, you're not paying each other to promote each other's books. And you know that they're targeted to the right audience because you are grouping up or doing a cross promotion with another author in the similar genre. So you don't have to worry about, <laughs> is the correct audience going to see this? And then they're pretty easy to set up because all you're agreeing to is dropping the link to that landing page for either the group promo or the other author's book into your newsletter. You're not switching all these toggles on and off and <laughs> messing with all these targeting metrics and all that stuff. So a good place to get started with building your mailing list. Another thing that you mentioned there is when you are driving traffic to your books for sale on Amazon, you can also still be collecting subscribers for your mailing list 
by using that reader magnet in the front or back matter of that book. So people that buy that book and then they want to learn more about your universe or your characters, they want, or maybe they want to get that side story or your anthology of short stories, whatever you've got there as your reader magnet, your free thing that you're giving to people when they sign up to your mailing list. If you have that as the call to action in your front or back matter of that book, those are going to be some of your best subscribers because it's proven that these are real readers. They're only going to sign up to your mailing list because They've actually opened up your book and gotten started reading it. And so if they see that call to action to get that other thing from you and they join your mailing list that way, they are more engaged than your average subscriber that just uh, is checking you out as a first look to get your reader magnet. In talking about that as well, I think an important piece here is earlier in this conversation, we were talking about books priced at $2.99. Is it the case that you recommend authors start a series with their book priced at $2.99? Or would you recommend that an author have the first book in their series be free and advertise that free book? And hopefully the conversion and read through to book two or three, et cetera, on the series is ultimately what is paying you back for those ads. So the read through and sell through through the rest of the books is almost always going to be what pays you back, regardless of what the initial price point is. For a starting point, I would recommend $299 in Kindle Unlimited if you're unsure of what to price book one at. $399 can work, $499 can work, $599 can work. But if you're just getting started with the ads and you're getting your feet wet, $2.99 is a good entry point because it's low enough that it's still somewhat in impulse buy territory, but it gets you that 70% royalty, which can make a big difference in terms of the profitability or lack thereof of the ads. And so if you're in Kindle Unlimited, another option is 99 cents, where the goal there is to be generating enough sales volume and enough visibility to the book to hopefully get the algorithms to kick in a bit and then have Amazon recommend the book to its Kindle Unlimited subscribers. So you can get that effect, of course, when the first book is priced at $2.99 or $3.99 or whatever, but your sales volume is going to be much lower. So it would take significantly more ad spend. So at 99 cents, you can push a lot more sales of that book and potentially get that to kick in. But of course, you're only making 35 cents a copy. So you need additional books in the series really for that strategy to even have the remote possibility of being profitable. And you're also taking a hit in terms of the sell through and read through because you're making less on that first book. And you're also getting a much lower percentage of people going from book one to book two, book three, book four, because when someone buys a book for 99 cents, they have much less of an investment in that series and they may never read the book at all or read a few pages that is not for them and then move on. Whereas they'll probably give it more time if they invest $2.99 in the book. So those are where I would start with experimenting with pricing if you're in Kindle Unlimited. And then if you're wide, instead of 99 cents, I would just do free for the start. I would either do $2.99, $3.99, $4.99, whatever you want to start with. Again, $2.99 is a good price when you're wide because it's in that impulse buy territory. So either full price or free when you're wide. And that's because you don't have that page read aspect where at 99 cents, you're just getting a 35 cent royalty, but you don't have the potential upside of Amazon recommending the book to a bunch of people and then getting page reads and making significantly more than the 35 cent royalty. Of course, Amazon can recommend the book to other people, but then you're just getting more sales at 99 cents and making 35 cents from them. So the numbers don't tend to work out as favorably as if you price book one for free, then you get significantly more downloads than you would at 99 cents. And it's a lot easier to get a download at 99 cents. So they're also much cheaper. Of course, your sell through again drops because the number of people who even open a free book is relatively low. 
and then they don't have anything invested. So if it's not grabbing them from the first couple pages, they can pretty quickly put it down, but you can get so much more download volume for your ad dollars, just because it's much cheaper to get a free download. So for example, if you're just starting out advertising a series and it's priced free, and let's say you're spending $5 a day, five, $10 a day, you might be able to get a download of that book for 12 cents or 20 cents because your CPC is also much lower. If you're advertising a free book, by the way, make sure that you have free in the headline. Make sure I would put free on the image as well. Just hammer home that idea that it's free. And then with a 99 cent book, you're probably looking at at the absolute lowest, a dollar as your cost per unit there. When I say cost per unit, I mean cost per sale or borrow in Kindle Unlimited. So you're probably looking at a dollar minimum. Really, it's going to be pretty difficult to get things down that low. So you're more looking at two, three, four dollars. And if you're only making 35 cents on the royalty, we can see how, all right, all of a sudden we need to make that up on the rest of the sales of the the rest of the series. Or you know, you really need the Kindle Unlimited reads to kick in from Amazon recommending the book organically because you're pushing so much volume at 99 cents. And then at full price, meaning $2.99 or higher, I'd say that you know, you're looking at two, three dollars at the absolute low end for your cost per unit. And then probably more realistically, like five, six, somewhere in there for a book that's working reasonably well with ads. All those stats that I just threw out were for books that work pretty well with the ads. And then at the absolute best numbers that I threw out there, that's like when the books are really firing on all cylinders. It's not unusual for you to advertise a full price book and get a cost per unit of $30 because the cover isn't dialed in, the blurb isn't dialed in, the ad settings aren't correct, the ad creative isn't compelling or some combination of all of those elements. If you're having trouble getting the ads to be profitable and if you're struggling with advertising, just know that that is normal and it is difficult. And it takes time to get everything working in concert with one another. How are you actually tracking the sell through from book one to book two, book three, et cetera? So if you check out the crash course, that will show you that in more detail. The equation that I use there is going to be, I can pull up a spreadsheet if people want to see just some hypothetical numbers that might be a little bit easier to visualize. So if you look at any of my materials, I refer to sell through as revenue per sale. I refer to read through as revenue per borrow. So if you're comparing terms across various resources, those are synonymous with one another. And revenue per sale is the amount that you make from a sale of book one when you factor in the sales of the other books in the series. And then revenue per borrow is the same idea for Kindle Unlimited. And some of you who have advertised before have no doubt seen these very lengthy and complex sell-through calculations and all that. This method gets you to the same end result. It's just much faster. And all that you need is the total series ebook revenue, and then the total ebook sales of book one to calculate this revenue per sale number. So let's say, for example, you look at a period of time and you want to look at a period of time when the data is relatively stable to calculate this because price changes will change your revenue per sale because you get more people going from book one to book two if your book one price is $2.99 versus 99 cents versus free, as we discussed earlier. You want to make sure that you don't have any major promo events like a book bub or a big Kindle countdown deal that you ran or something like that. And you also want to make sure that you haven't launched any books in the series during that time frame because that will throw things off. And there are ways to adjust for that, but it's going to be a lot easier if you just find a period of time where you don't have a lot of 
things impacting the series numbers and potentially skewing them. You want a period of time where optimally you have 30 sales of book one or more. The smaller your sample size, the more prone to variance these numbers are. And so you can calculate it if you have fewer than 30 sales, but really you would want more than 30 and optimally more than 100. I realize that if you're just starting out, then it's hard to find a period of time that's both stable and also has more than 30 or 100 sales, but that's what I would like to see there. And so all that we do here is we take the total series ebook revenue, which you can find on your KDP dashboard. And you can also find the total ebook sales of book one on your KDP dashboard. And let's say you made $1,256.42. And you would want this only in the region where you're analyzing the ads. Let's say you're running the ads in the US. You would just take the total series ebook revenue from the US because the revenue per sale and the revenue per borrow they are going to differ across different regions because the page read rate is different. The royalty that you're making is different because your pricing is different. So you want to calculate these numbers on a region by region basis. And if you get an accurate number here, you only have to calculate this once and then you can calculate it again when you have a new release in the series because that will change the number. Or if you have a price change of book one in the series, then you can recalculate it. So our total series ebook revenue in the US in this hypothetical example is $1,256.42. And then let's say we had 135 sales of book one. All that we have to do, and you can do this by hand, you can do it with a calculator. You don't have to use Excel or Google Sheets. We just take the total series ebook revenue and divide that by the total ebook sales of book one. And here, we have a situation where for every sale of book one that we generate, this is what this number is telling us, we make $9.31 when we factor in the sales of book two, book three, book four, et cetera. For a situation where you have a revenue per sale of $9.31, you're probably, that would probably be a six, seven book series at minimum. So if you're getting this type of number and you have two books in the series, it's probably wrong, just as an FYI. So you can also calculate this for multiple different periods, and that helps you get an idea of what the actual accurate or reasonably accurate number is. For the read-through, what we do is the same thing. We take our total series KU revenue, and then we take the total borrows of book one, and we divide our KU revenue divided by book one borrows. So let's say the series made $1,400 in KU. To calculate borrows, Amazon doesn't give us this metric, so we need to estimate it. We take the page reads divided by what's known as the KEMPC in the book. That's just Amazon's term for Kindle Unlimited pages. So divided by the number of KEMPC, and that will give you the borrows. You can find the KEMPC on your KDP dashboard. So if I head over to kdp.amazon.com, all that I have to do is search for the book in question. Let's say I want the number of Kindle Unlimited pages for this book, Drop Dead. I mouse over these three dots here, select KDP Select Info, and then scroll down to the bottom of the page. And we can see that Kindle Edition Normalized Page Count, which is what KMPC stands for, we have 268 pages. So let's say during the period of time that I'm looking at my Royalty data, I had 17,000 or 170,000, let's say 72, 720 page reads. And then I would divide that by the number of Kindle Unlimited pages in the book. And so I got 637 here. And then I would take the series KU revenue, divide it by the number of borrows of book one, and I get 220. This is kind of a weird example because it probably wouldn't be this low unless your books are very short, but that's how you calculate the revenue per sale and revenue per borrow, which again are synonymous with sell-through value and read-through value if you've come across those elsewhere. And what these numbers tell you is how much you make when someone buys book one of the series or borrows book one of the series. And one mistake that I see is that people will not calculate these separately. They'll just calculate one number 
and apply that for both the KU side of things and the sales side of things. But what we can see here is that these numbers can vary significantly. Now, these this is just a made up example, but the numbers can diverge very dramatically from one another because of the pricing of the books, which is going to impact the revenue per sale, the length of the books, which is going to impact your revenue per borrow. If you write very short, then you don't make that much in Kindle Unlimited. And so even if you have a longer series, even with the read through to all those other books, you may find that your revenue per borrow is very low in comparison to your revenue per sale. So you want to calculate those separately. And then that gives you an idea of how much you're making and what amount of headroom you have to spend on the ads. So here it would be pretty limited because I'm not making very much in Kindle Unlimited. That makes sense. That's super helpful. Uh, thanks so much for sharing those calculations. And I know we're a bit over time now. So thank you so much for coming to chat with us today. If people have other questions and they want to find out more info, where should they go to check out your courses and other information? You can just head over to nicholaseric.com. That's Nicholas Eric with a K, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S. And then you can sign up for my newsletter and it's probably the best way to stay updated on whatever I'm doing with the marketing stuff. And I share case studies and marketing tips and things like that. And then for the crash course, I don't know what the exact link is, but uh, I'll make sure that Evan has that so he can send it out and you can check that out if you're interested in learning more about Facebook ads. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Nick, for coming to chat with us today. And if anyone has any questions on Story Origin as well, you can always reach out to me, Evan at storyoriginapp.com. Uh, thank you all for coming and spending your time with us. And we will see you all in the next one.